So thank us for the invitation. It's always fun to come to Small and Speak. So what I'm going to, <laughs> yes, no? I think someone just, I think, uh, okay. I think just entered the waiting room. Okay, and so the students who are listening should have the ability to act as God and let people in as they see fit. So mm -hmm. hopefully if somebody else is trying to join remotely, they will let them in. So what I wanna do is talk a little bit about some of the mathematics some of my students are looking at this summer so that when you see them scribbling on the walls or just mumbling in their sleep or in the hallways, it makes hopefully a little bit more sense as to what they're doing. There's a lot of different things going on. And so I am not necessarily choosing my favorite project. It's always like, you know, when you have kids, you know, which kids you like the most, you know, I'm not saying I love the second up students more than I do the others. I'm not saying I don't. I'm just saying this is the project I think I can present completely in a short amount of time and show you some really good math ideas and concepts, which might be of use for other things. The other projects would take a little bit more time to get into detail. There's well over 100, maybe over 150 slides here. I am not expecting to get anywhere near that. It is always better to be a little bit over prepared so you can present more things if needed. And so if I don't make it to random matrix theory and you're not in my group doing random matrix theory and you want to know more about that and L functions, always happy to chat. I, at some point, some of my students may discreetly start moving towards the stage or not so discreetly, depending on where they're sitting. All right, so what I want to do is talk a little bit about stuff related to Fibonacci numbers, which are wonderful springboards to a lot of great mathematics. And so this is joint work with a variety of small teams over the years, up to and including the 2021 iteration. All right, so hopefully everybody has seen the Fibonacci numbers before. If not, this is where you just know, you go, yeah, you move your hand like this, you go, oh yeah. Does anything look strange if you're not in my group about the definition of the Fibonacci numbers here? Yes. Uh, there are no seeds. There are no what? Well, in, there is implicitly seeds because I've given you the first few. So I've given you one, two as the initial seeds. Is that the initial seeds you normally have? No, what do you normally do? One, one, what else could you normally do? Zero, one. Zero, one. So there's actually three types of people. All right. This is different than the, there's 10 types of people, those who know binary and those who don't. There are three types of people in terms of how you choose to define your Fibonacci numbers. And the reason we choose to do it this way is the following beautiful theorem due to Zeckendorf. Every positive integer can be written uniquely as a sum of non-consecutive Fibonacci numbers. Well, if I had two ones, that's gonna really kill the uniqueness. If I have a zero, that's also gonna cause trouble. So I need to write them like this. So the first proof is the greedy algorithm. So I take the number 51 and I look at what is the largest Fibonacci number less than or equal to 51. It should now move up into red 34. So I write 30, 51 is 34 plus 17. So F8, the eighth Fibonacci number plus 17. And then I just lather, rinse, repeat. What is the largest Fibonacci number less than equal to 17? That's gonna be 13. So I'll write it now as 34 plus 13 plus four. And you just keep iterating and there is your decomposition. So I'll leave it as an exercise for you to prove that this always works and that no number can have two different decompositions. So it's a really nice application of the greedy algorithm. Now. This is probably the most useless application of the Fibonacci numbers known to man, woman, and child, and roadkill. If you take your Fibonacci decomposition and increase all the indices by one, you go from 51 to 83, and 51 miles is approximately 82.1 kilometers. So does anybody know why this works? Again, not in, not in the Miller group. Yes. Yes, the conversion factor between miles and kilometers is almost the golden mean. And as the Fibonacci numbers get larger, each Fibonacci number is approximately the golden mean more than the previous. So if you are traveling in a foreign country, and um, it can be either way, going from miles to kilometers or kilometers to miles, you can use this to quickly convert and figure out what speed you should be driving. And hopefully you can do that without getting into an accident because we're math people. All right, here is another way of looking at the Fibonacci numbers. They are the unique sequence such that every number can be written uniquely as a sum of non-adjacent terms. So let's start with the number one. Well, if I can only use non-adjacent terms and I only have the number one, I can't get two, so I have to add two to my sequence. I can't add one and two and I can use each number at most once, so I have to add three. Can I get four? Yeah, one plus three. I can't get five, so I have to add five. Can I get six? Yeah, five plus one, seven, five plus two, sure. And so I add eight. And you just keep going on and on and on like this. 
And it turns out this is an equivalent definition of the Fibonacci. So there's a nice interplay between the recurrence relation and the definition of the Fibonacci's and the decomposition properties of writing something in terms of that. Okay, there are other ways of looking at these problems. And so one of the, I think, best uses of Grant Money ever was to buy the Cookie Monster. I do regret not buying the $200 Cookie Monster that would be the size of some of you in the audience. But I figured, you know, this one is more portable and fits in the backpack when you travel. But it would be nice to have the $200 Cookie Monster in the office nowadays. I would go well with Professor Gowdy's slide rule if you've ever seen his office. So here is another way of viewing the decomposition problem. And this is going to be a far more involved proof than the greedy algorithm. But it's going to give us a lot more at the end of the day. So you might have seen this as the stars and bars problem. I like to call it the cookie problem. The number of ways of dividing C cookies among P people, distinct people, is C plus P minus 1 choose P minus 1. So we will assume that the people are distinct, that you can tell the difference. If you become an engineering PhD student, that is not necessarily a valid assumption with your advisor, is they sometimes just have research teams and the PhD students are sadly somewhat interchangeable. The cookies we will assume are identical. You cannot tell one cookie apart. All that matters is how many cookies you get, not which ones. And so why is this the case? Well, the best way is to imagine the original classic cookie monster. This is the cookie monster who is always game for eating cookies. And I was told that he will have some interesting of cookies in the very near future. So Cookie Monster is going to be very, very happy. He's got space to put them in excellent. So imagine you have C plus P minus one cookies in a line and Cookie Monster comes and eats P minus one cookie. That's going to divide what is left over into P sets. So this is one of the biggest techniques we have in combinatorics. You prove something by telling a story and you relate what you want to something else. So in the special case where we have eight cookies and five people, here are eight plus five minus one cookies. Cookie Monster shows up. Cookie Monster gobbles four cookies. Everything up to the first gobbled cookie goes to the first person. So the first person gets two. Next person gets zero. Next person gets two, then three, then one. Does anything bother you about this decomposition? Yes. Someone got zero. Someone got zero cookies, right? So you can actually put in constraints. I want to make sure everybody gets at least one cookie. I won't consider any decomposition like that. Again, Wednesday tea people, you can do whatever you want. You're in charge. You don't have to have everybody gets at least one. You can put constraints like that very easily. What you would do is if everybody has to have one cookie, well, just give everybody one cookie to begin with. And now rather than dividing eight cookies, how many cookies are we dividing? Great. It's very easy to put in lower Restrictions. Everyone must get at least this many. Upper ones are much, much harder. All right. And so if you want to write a math paper, and I know the Udash group was you know, having a conversation about this, you really should not be talking about Cookie Monster and aim for high journal. I know, I know. So we rephrase it as we're counting the number of solutions of x1 plus dot dot xp equals c, where the xi's are greater than or equal to zero. We're solving the Diophantine equation. And now when you write this, the mathematicians will you know, read your paper without you know, giving you that look that I get. All right, so how can we use this to solve the Zeckendorf problem? There's always a danger of doing algebra in public. The general rule is don't. I will show it, nod your head a little bit. Um, if you really care, look at the slides later. I just want to give you the rough idea. So imagine we have some number between Fn and Fn plus one. And it's good to do this because this way our numbers are all about the same size. If I look at all the numbers from one to Fn and I try to see how many summons they have, well, they go over so many orders of magnitude that maybe it's not fair to be comparing numbers near one and numbers near F2000. So we localize, we look at an interval Fn to Fn plus one. Well, if you're in that interval, you have to have Fn as one of your summons. And then we have a bunch of other summons. We have Fn as a summon, and I'm going to look and count how many ways do we have exactly K summons. So that means we have K minus one additional summons. And the indices satisfy a certain condition. You know, one is less than equal to I1, less than I2, and so on and so on. The last one has to be IN, and the gap between every two of them has to be at least two. What does this remind you of? Does this look like anything we've seen? Yeah, the cookie problem. Like, this is just the cookie problem. And so basically, the gaps between summons is the number of cookies that you're giving. 
And everybody has to now have at least two cookies for the very first one, which has to have at least one. And so, you know, again, doing the algebra properly, you write down the Ds as the distances. And at the end of the day, you get the number of ways to have exactly K summons is just N minus K choose K minus one. You then show that no two decompositions can give you the same number. And when you count them all up, so when you sum these binomial coefficients, it turns out you get Fn minus one, which is exactly the number of numbers in the interval. So every number has exactly one decomposition. This is far more complicated than the greedy algorithm, but at the end of the day, it gives you a lot more. It gives you how often do you have exactly K summons. You can then prove results such as what's the distribution of the number of summons. It turns out that becomes Gaussian. You can talk about what's the gap between summons. Uh, it's a nice exponential decay involving the golden mean. How long do you have to wait? What's the longest gap you have? It's like tossing a fair coin. So there's a tremendous amount of stuff that you can now prove. Okay, so, um, oops, for two slides. Nope, one slide. Okay, so for example, if we take 18, we divide 18 as 13 plus 5, that's its second of decomposition. But I could also write it as 13 plus 3 plus 2, which has more summons. As you could ask, what is the fewest number of summons I need to represent a number? And you know, some numbers have many different summons, or so many different decompositions, but they'll only have one second of decomposition. Uh, it turns out that no decomposition ever uses fewer summons than the second row. So you could have something that has exactly the same number. If I give you the number 10, 10's decomposition is 8 plus 2, but it's also 5 plus 5. But second row is always minimal. There's nothing that's going to be less than that. And so then you can ask, you know, how do you prove that nothing can use fewer summons than second row? And can you generalize this? If instead of looking at Fibonacci's, if I look at more general recurrences, would this still be true? And so I'm not going to really go through all the details. Small did this a few years ago. If you hit pause now on the slides, you can see it. All right. So I want to start introducing the various ingredients for the proof. Some of these are pretty standard, especially if you do math competitions. Others really haven't been covered in the undergraduate curriculum. These are things that just fall through the cracks. And I wanted to use today's talk as an opportunity to try to highlight some things that fall through the cracks. So the first is an invariant. It is a quantity that doesn't change. So you know, mass and energy in classical physics is a great example of an invariant. Uh, if you travel in a straight line, then the total distance traveled at the end is independent of how many stops you make. You've made that distance. Uh, if you take a meter and you bend it in two places and make a triangle, the area of the triangle can differ, but the perimeter is always going to be one. Most quantities in life are not invariant. Can somebody give me a quantity associated either to yourself or to me that might change over time? Age, age yes. Which way will age change? Yeah, it's only going to go up, right? If any of you can fix that, please let me know, uh, especially in the next three, four decades, hopefully not sooner. So a monovariant is a quantity that can only move in one direction like age. Would weight count as a monovariant? No, maybe when you're young, weight is maybe approximately a monovariant, at least if you look at it month by month by month. But, so it's something that only moves in one way. It either stays the same or always goes down or stays the same and always goes up. So a lot of examples, the number of pieces on board in the game of chess or checkers. The pieces themselves don't have to be constant. So what's a change that could happen in chess or checkers that changes the piece? Capture, and so you could lose a piece. What else? You could promote a pawn or promote a checker and have it become a queen or a king. So you can definitely change what types of pieces you have, but not the number. You don't have pieces all of a sudden created in the midst of a chess game. Uh, scores in a sports contest, normally you don't have, no matter how bad a team is doing, you lost three points this in. Uh, okay, so there's a lot of quantities that move in just one possible direction. There's a lot of applications of this. If you've seen fixed point theorems and Nash won a Nobel Prize, really in economics, but still a Nobel Prize. Well, actually it's not a Nobel Prize. Uh, it's, a, it's close to a Nobel Prize, but he won it for applying fixed point theorems in economics and game theory. And the big ingredient to prove that certain games had a you know, winning strategy was a fixed point theorem. And so you know, one of my favorite arguments, you know, Sperner's lemma, which leads to certain fixed point theorems, the one-dimensional version is all about looking at a monovariant, looking about something that only moves in one direction. Uh, zombie apocalypse, watching you know, the spread of a certain infection 
That's another great example. If you've seen Conway's soldier problem, the Cheka problem, that's another example. If you're interested in stuff like this, you know, there's a couple of links to some other videos with these and a bunch of other examples of just applying monovariance. It's often difficult to find what is the right monovariant to look at. Depending on the problem, it's a bit of an art to see which one you should study. So what I want to do is I want to show a monovariant that you can use for the Fibonacci that will very quickly give us that nothing can beat the Zeckendorf decomposition. And then we'll look and see what we can do with this knowledge. So the idea of the proof is the following. So let's imagine we have a decomposition. So we have B1 copies of F1, the first Fibonacci, all the way up to Bn copies of Fn, the nth Fibonacci number. And we'll define the index of B to be this weighted sum of the number of copies we have of each uh, summit. So it'll be B1 times one, all the way up to Bn times F. And then what we're going to do is the Fibonacci recurrence gives us two different types of moves. We can split a Fibonacci number. So we had, you know, if we had five plus five, we could write that as eight plus two. And when you think about what's going on, we replace two copies of FK with one thing that's one large, FK plus one, and one thing that's two smaller, FK minus two. It's a little bit of an annoyance because you have to figure out, well, what do I do with F2? Because I'm not starting my recurrence relation with zero, one, one. I'm starting with one, two, three. And there's two different ways you can view it. I can view two copies of F2 as F3 plus F1, or I could view it as one plus one goes all the way up to. So there's a couple of ways to you know, deal with this. Um, it's a little bit annoying. So two copies of F2, I can split into F1 plus F3. And then I can combine two adjacent Fibonacci numbers. If I have five and eight, I can replace that with a 13. So FK plus FK plus one is FK plus two. And again, you have to be a little bit careful. F1 plus F1 is F2, it's, it's the same index. To fix this, uh, one of my small groups is actually looking at a generalization of the Fibonacci game. And they'll be presenting on that in a couple of minutes where things are cleaned up so we don't have to worry about this as much. So it turns out that every time you do a legal move, one of these two moves, your index never grows. It either stays the same or gets smaller. And this is just a very simple calculation to look at what happens if I replace you know, two copies of FK with FK plus one plus FK minus two. You can just do the algebra. And you can use this to show that as you keep moving, no matter what initial decomposition you start with, eventually you will end up with the second of decomposition. Uh, a better decomposition, a better in monovariant to use is not just the weighted sum of the indices, but the weighted sum where instead of taking the index, you multiply by the square root of the index. It's going to just clean it up. So rather than being less than or equal to, it's always strictly less than. It just makes the argument a little bit easier. All right, so what I want to do now is turn to the last part and probably not going to get to too much random matrix theory today is talk about a game that I created uh, based on the Fibonacci numbers. Alyssa Epstein was a thesis student of mine and she was tasked with analyzing this game so that I could beat my daughter. And that was her goal for her thesis. And I actually pulled my daughter from school to come to Alyssa's defense. And Alyssa was told that if Kayla beats her, she may not you know, graduate from Williams, you know, the pressure was on. And Alyssa was able to partly answer the questions I asked. So let me explain the game first and talk a little bit about game theory and some nice ways of analyzing some games. So it's a two play game. So you alternate turns, whoever moves last wins. And the way it works is we start off with you know, our Fibonacci bins and we start off with N tokens on F1 and everything else is empty. And then we're gonna just play using the Fibonacci relation and just do legal moves and keep playing. When do you think we're gonna stop? And what state do you think the game will end and there'll be no more moves? And again, this is not for the people who are working on this project. So we start with N copies on F1 and we keep playing. At what point do you think the game will end and there'll be no more moves possible? And a second of decomposition. So in a second of decomposition, excellent. You can't have two copies in any index. So we can't do a split move. And you can't have anything adjacent, so you can't do a combined. So the theory is that maybe if we play, we will eventually hit a second of decomposition, at which point the game stops. And we just have to figure out what's the strategy to get there. So a turn is one of the following two. You can either take 
uh, two pieces on an FK and split it. Or you can take a piece of FK and FK plus one and combine to an FK plus two. And so in the second move, you actually decrease the number of tokens on the board by one. In the first, you keep the number of tokens constant. All right, so does the game end? If so, how long does it take? For each end, who has the winning strategy? And the last one is, what is the winning strategy? Does, can somebody tell me the, the difference between an existence proof and a constructive proof? Or at least a theorem that you might know from calculus or real analysis, that's an existence theorem, but not a constructive. Good. So existence, you just say it exists. There is a quantity that has this property, constructive, and this is it right here. Or at least this is at least one example of it. So can somebody give me a theorem where you have existence, but you don't have it constructive? You don't know where it is. You just know that it exists. Yes. Intermediate value theorem. Excellent. You know, if at A, we're at five, and at B, we're at 10, then we must hit every value between five and 10 if we're continuous, but we don't know where. What else? Yes. Uh, mean, value mean value theorem. You know, if we have a continuous differentiable function, there is some point. For a lot of things, we just need to know that a point exists. For other things, it would be nice to know. So you know, imagine you have been hired as a political consultant for the 2024 presidential election, and you tell your client, good news, I have determined that you have a path to 270 electoral votes. Wonderful, and what is that path we have? It's an existence proof. <laughs> yeah. It's at least nice to know that you have a chance, but it's not as useful. Uh, how many of you have heard of the coffee cup theorem? If you stir coffee continuously, at least one point returns to where it started, but we don't know which point that is. So there's a lot of things in math that are non-constructive. And it turns out what, my, what Alyssa was able to do is she came up with a non-constructive proof that player two will always have a winning strategy if n is at least three. So let me show you what a game looks like. So start off with 10 pieces at F1 and everything else is empty. So since we have 10 pieces at F1, the only thing we can do is take two things at F1 and make something at F2. So the first move is boring, it's forced on us. So now we have eight pieces at F1 one piece at F2, notice the sum is still 10. We have two things we could do. We could take a one and a two and make a three, or we could take two things on a one and make a two. So let's take two things on a one and make a two. So now we have a couple of things we could do. We could take a one and a two and make a three. We could take two ones and make a two, or we could take a two and split it to a one and a three. So let's take a two and let's split it to a one and a three. And so again, you know, we have lots of different things we can do here. No, no, we don't. Because of that zero, the only thing we can do now is we have to take two things at the one and make something out of two. And now we have several possibilities. We can take two things at a one and make a two, a one and a two and make a three, or a two and a three and make a five. And so we'll do that and we make an F4 and the game just keeps playing. And eventually the game has no moves left. And in this version, player one was the champion. And so here, is a list of all the moves. When you look at this table, something should be screaming at you. What looks strange in this table? Nothing looks strange in this table? Yeah, yeah there's a gap. So there's a gap because at this stage, instead of going to here, there was another move we could have done. We could have actually moved here. We could have taken the two things that were in F2 and split to an F1 and an F3 instead of, um, what did we do instead? Instead of taking a one and a two and making a three. And so if we do that, it would have increased the game by one move and it would have switched who would have won. So a lot of these games, it all comes down to some kind of move steal, some kind of parity switch. But the way you win is you switch parity with someone else and you get yourself into a point. 
So all games end in finitely many moves. The idea is basically to use the monovariant involving the square root. And when you go through the calculation, you just see every time you make a move, it's going to decrease. Uh, we have upper bounds on how long the game is going to be. Turns out games are going to be on the order of n, and the order depends on the golden mean. We have thoughts as to what the fastest game is going to be and what that strategy should be. We have a conjecture that the number of moves in a random game should converge to a Gaussian. And then here is the non-constructive proof that player two has a winning strategy. And so, you know, we, we had to give Alyssa her, you know, thesis. We had to let her graduate. You know, she did answer the problem to some extent, you know, you know, can I beat my daughter? Yes, go first. But the details, you know, ah, the devil is in the details. And so it is still open. I, no one I have talked to has a proof of what a winning strategy would be. There are some conjectures coming out from the smallest to what might be a good strategy to win. So what I want to do is I want to show you a proof stealing strategy. If you haven't seen arguments like this before, these are really nice. They're applicable in a lot of areas. They're very simple. And it's nice to have a couple of things like this in your arsenal. So rather than doing it initially with the Fibonacci game, I thought I would do it first with a simpler game. How many of you have ever played this game? I think it's called Chomp. You start off with a rectangular grid of dots. And on your turn, you choose a dot and you eat every dot from that point upwards. So if I choose this dot here, I would eat six dots, everything from here up and everything here to the right. And in this game, whoever goes last loses. Why wouldn't the game be whoever goes last wins? What would the strategy be then? Yeah, bottom left. Yeah, the game would be extremely boring, right? If whoever goes last wins, the strategy is very easy. Take the bottom left, the game terminates in one move. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to prove to you that player one has a winning strategy. And it's going to be a non-constructive proof. So there are two possibilities. What are the two possibilities? So what are the two possibilities? Player one has a winning strategy for the board or player two. Right, so I'm going to prove to you player one has a winning strategy. So case one, player one has a winning strategy. What should player one do in the case when player one has a winning strategy? Do that strategy. Okay, that handles case one. Case two, we now assume player two has the winning strategy. So no matter what player one does on their opening move, Player two has a way to win the game. Player one decides they will go in the upper right corner. Player two, by assumption, has a winning strategy. They have some place where if they go there, they will be on the path to victory. I don't know where that is. Just because I have to draw something, let's say it's over there. And now player one pauses. And player one knows from this point onward, if player two plays correctly, from this board, whoever goes next loses. And player one is rethinking their initial move in the upper right corner. Hmm. Any thoughts where player one should go on their opening move? Yeah, where player two went. And so player one says, I changed my mind. I want my opening move to be where you went. And it's my turn now. I'm going there. And now it's your turn. And so if player two had a winning strategy, player one can do something like this and steal it. So you can do something similar with the Fibonacci game. And so this is just meant to try to concisely highlight what is going on. You know, we start off one to the end. That means we have n tokens on one. One to the n minus one wedge two means we have n minus two tokens on one and one token on two. Uh, this over here would mean we have n minus seven on one, two on two and one on three. Notice it still sums up to one. Let's assume player one had a winning strategy. So we're gonna color things pink if player one has a winning strategy from that point with player one going and blue if player two has a winning strategy. So we have to color this pink because player one has the winning strategy. So the only move player one has is to come to this board and now it's gonna be player two's turn. What color do I have to color this? has to be pink or orange or whatever this is being displayed now. So player two has a turn. No matter what they do, 
we have assumed player one has a winning strategy. So both of these have to still be colored pink. Let's analyze just one half of this, because if we can analyze one half with patience, we can do the other. So over here, it's player one's turn. Well, nice, player one only has one possible move. Player two has three moves. No matter where player one goes, your player one still has to have the winning move. And now when we look from this point over here, this has two possible moves. You know, one of the possible moves is to go here. But notice, this is the same as the game state over here. We got to the same game state in two different ways. But in one state, we took one extra move. That extra move flips who's going to win. And so now this gets colored blue. And so then if you just trace things backwards, oops, uh, you will then see that it will then propagate upward and lead to a contradiction. So this is a way to prove that player two has a winning strategy that at a certain moment in time, they can, if they need to, steal. The problem is we don't know when they need to steal. And so if anybody has any ideas on how to make this work, please talk to me, please talk to the second door group. I'm going to turn it over to Faye now, who is going to say a few words about the uh, generalizations that they are looking at now, which clean up a lot of the notation. So you can just... Okay. Um, so this is the game that we're setting, often called the abstract second north game. And so if you ever see any of us writing weird acronyms on the board, most of them come from this one, the AZG. Um, and so this is a game which gets rid of the boundary conditions, which um, Professor Miller conveniently swept under the rug. Um, so the boundary conditions in the classical second dwarf game are you can combine two ones to make a two, and you can split two twos to make a three and a one. Um, these moves are different from all the other moves in the game. Um, our way to fix this, credit to Ben Bailey, is to um, remove the boundary. So play instead of on an infinite tape of all your Fibonacci bends, play on an infinite tape which goes in both directions. Um, and the way you do this is you have a combined move, you can take two indices right there, um, subtract one off that one, subtract one off that one, um, and add one there, just like in the, in the regular second dwarf game. And in your split move, you do the exact same thing. You split, you subtract two there, add one, add one. And now the question comes up, why do we care? Um, so in the original second dwarf game, we care because of second dwarf decompositions. So the natural question now to ask is, this is a game, it's kind of strange. What does it have to do with decompositions of numbers in weird ways? So the particular type of decompositions that we're interested in and which come from this game are called base phi decompositions where phi is the Gorham ratio, um, one plus square root of five over two, um, as I hope we're all familiar with that one. Uh, and so what's an example? Um, this is the really, really slow way to compute a base PD composition, um, play the game on a, on a starting state. So we're gonna start with a six as our tuple. We split the six. I don't have fancy animations like Professor Miller. Um, we split the six, get a one, zero, four, one. Um, we combine these two. That gets us one, zero, three, zero, one. Split, split, combine, combine. And we end up with this tuple. Now, you'll notice I've colored the center index red. Why? Because I want to keep track of it. So I keep kept track. And what happens is if I look at V, this, and I interpret this as phi to the zero, phi to the one, phi squared, phi cubed, this is phi to the negative one, phi to the negative two, phi to the negative three, phi to the negative four, I see that six is actually equal to phi cubed plus phi plus phi to the negative four. You can do this with any number. Um, you can take any number and write it as a sum of powers of phi, um, which are non-adjacent and where you only use one of each power. Uh, and just play the game. So that's the game we're interested in. Everybody on board? I like this game a lot. So here's a summary of our results. Um, go quick, give us all the tea pretty quickly. Um, so the first result, which is a product of a long labor of my heart, um, it is that if you have any initial configuration, so now we're kind of generalizing beyond starting with n ones, as, as you'd say, if you have any initial configuration, 
which has n summands and is b y, then you terminate in O of n squared plus b n moves. Uh, the proof of this is difficult, uh, but the key ideas are you have a couple of invariants and monovariants, very similar to um, what Professor Miller does with the Zeckendorf game. So if we go back one. Yes. Okay. If we go back one, one of the things you'll notice is that our split move and our combined move um, will preserve the total sum. So you can think of this as a weighted sum over your tuple, um, where you weight by powers of b, and every move preserves that sum. That's the key invariant, which basically drives the whole game. Um, another thing you can notice is that combines always drop the number of summands by one, and splits keep the number of summands the same. Putting a few of these together and using another root, so this is a key, key point. If I replace these speeds by negative one over phi, um, the equation will stay the same. Uh, and this has to do with phi and negative one over phi being roots of the same polynomial, namely x squared minus x minus one is equal to zero. Uh, and so a couple of these invariants, throw them together, be a little bit clever, and you can get that first result and be a lot smarter than us about how you got it, um, because now we know how to do it the right way. Um, the second result which we're looking at is if you look at the average number of summands, um, similar to what Professor Miller did with second work decompositions of previous students, um, in the interval from the i Lucas number to the i plus one Lucas number, um, we've calculated the mean number of summands, um, which is really cool. Um, it's something like one minus one over root five times i, can't remember the exact specifics. Um, and we conjecture this distribution of the number of summands to be Gaussian and the um, and if you want to know why, ask the second probability people because I don't know. Um, our third result, um, if you want to talk about it, talk to Ethan, he's probably the expert, um, is that the AZG is extremely hard. Um, so namely, if you play on a slightly abstracted game board, um, namely a directed acyclic graph uh, instead of a tape, it's a p-space hard problem to decide who wins on any particular tape in any initial configuration. Um, which means it's very, very, very hard, um, harder than MP. Um, and over a wide family of directed acyclic graphs, tiered graphs, um, it is instead a P space complete problem, um, which means it's both P space hard and um, it's, well, I don't know complexity theory very well, so I can't phrase this exactly the right way, but it's P space hard and it's also in P space. Um, and so those are kind of our results. There's a smattering of our th things that we've gotten on to the way here and to other stuff, but this is the idea. So I think that's a good summary. I think it's a good summary, thank you. All right, and then I think I'm gonna stop here and then if people do have questions about the random matrix theory stuff, I'm happy to talk about that, but I wanna make sure we all have plenty of time to do work, so I will end here.